We're going to finish this up and then do some on choosing your successor. A lot of you in here I've seen have already, you have your successor already in mind. Uh, let me ask of the farmers, how many of you are the CEO of your farm operation? You are the top dog? Okay. How many successors are in here? Potential successors. Okay. Mothers, wives, mothers, wives or mothers? Are there any, very many son in laws, daughter in laws? Well, you, now you're. You're both, I guess, but what I want to do one of the sessions tomorrow is to break you up into about three groups and just give you some questions so that you don't have to just sit here and listen to me yak for a while, but just have some discussion among yourselves and then the group arrive at a consensus on some priorities and report them back out so that you don't have to figure, your husband didn't have to know it was you that brought it up, or vice versa. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> strategic management, I already talked about some of these. This I'll go over fairly quickly. I, t I had the definition earlier, strategic management. If you got to pass those skills along to somebody, what are some of the ways you can do it? I'll pet, skip over the Gretzky quote. These different things that negotiation skills is one thing I didn't have in there, but I think that's really important. So much has to be, whether it's contracts, terms with the bank, terms with the landlord, within the family, with employees. As we move toward, toward qualified suppliers, vertically coordinated operations, Collaborative arrangements, that's going to be a bigger one. And we don't give it, there is much training on it, or if it is, it's very cookbookish. I I think some of you have been through Jack Williams' thing he does for Babe Group strategic negotiation. I think he does a real good job. It needs to be situational. You need to understand your walking waypoint, your strength in the negotiation. Are you the one in power? Or are you the kind of, he can walk away from this at any time. But you need to understand kind of what approaches to take because it's critical. I think these others up above are a lot of them, I think, the peer groups that the, sitting down doing the, what I call autopsies, discussing the assumptions, revisiting the decisions made and the results of them. And what you learn from it, what do we do differently? It's all what's involved in becoming, developing the skill set. I think one of the bad things about secrecy is that the next generation doesn't, it's, it's a very ineffective way for them to learn only, not that they shouldn't learn from it, from their own experience, their own mistakes, as far rather than just sharing the accumulated wisdom and experience of their seniors, it may be different, but they can pick up something and build on it. It's kind of like having the core competencies, and then growing the business on out past that. In terms of strategic plan, and I know a lot of you don't have these. It's, that's not if you have ones in your head. Only one third of Family size farm farm businesses. I don't mean that whole 2.1 million even have a strategic plan. Why not? Well, time is one that didn't even up here. But the other is because to really do a good job of strategic planning, not just putting together a business plan, but thinking about you know long term. What do we want to go? What are the What's, how's the market changing? What are the opportunities? How do we position ourselves? 
One requires sharing information, and there's an awful lot of CEOs that don't share information. Second, responding to the idea, this is even worse, responding to the idea of others and defending your own ideas. I've decided this. Why? If if you have something and somebody asks you why and you don't have a reason for it other than that's the way we've done it before and we've always done it, you need to rethink it. Because if you don't have a good reason for it, that I know the guys, the most successful producers I know out there, and I don't mean producers, farm, farmers, managers, or whatever, said that any time they hear someone say, when they say, why do you do it that way? Well, that's the way we've always done it. I know I have a competitive advantage over them because they're stuck in a rut. There's some opportunity I've got it. The other is if you have a strategic plan, it doesn't mean it's locked in concrete, but you're kind of committed to the plan. If you're going to change it, you need to have a discussion. All plans are open to revision and updating. The idea of it being a once and done thing is old school. This needs to be a living document. And as the world changes, as you change, as your circumstances, your family change, you can do it. And a lot of real entrepreneurs, a lot of farmers are very much entrepreneurs. In some cases, it's, it's a combination of two things. They are entrepreneurs and they want to be independent. They're not entrepreneurs in the sense of they're heavy risk takers. A lot of entrepreneurs are guys that see something, go after it, or trying to create something new. But still, the idea of putting anything down on paper, I'd rather keep my options open and to myself. Which is, you can say good, bad, that's the way I do it. But all I mean is that's why most operations don't have strategic plans. The thing that's worse is only a third of them that ever develop them ever implement them. And a large time, part of it is they don't have a management system in place. If you read like Whitman's book, if you see that in this thing, we don't have the systems in place to implement a plan, to monitor it, to have some reaction when something's going wrong. Um, this one board I'm on, that's in multiple states. They've hired a guy from Microsoft full time on staff to develop an ERP system that pulls information out a lot of inventory systems, marketing systems, everything else, accounting systems, and feeds it together so they have dashboards that anybody in the company can look at that summarize information. They have something like 300, and they probably have more than that now, pivots around the United States. Every pivot has a radio mon frequency monitor on it with soil tensiometers. They can tell what the subsoil moisture is. They can tell the wind speed, the direction of wind speed, humidity, temperature, 24 hours a day, if equipment's raining or if it's not. And Yes, the local agronomists can do that, but they can read it on the, the computers of the central office as well. So it's, it's just a lot of information that it takes. That mit Now, of course, the good thing is, for many of you, you aren't operating in Florida and North Dakota and, and Maryland and Texas. So you don't have this big, all that scale to go over, but information is critical. Communication and information are critical to get most things done. The reality is the most successful businesses out there actually have three plans, not one. If you listen to this, it's just, okay, more, this yo-yo is just stressing more and more plans we have to have. One, they have a long-term strategic plan. 
you know, this the worst thing I've seen are these huge documents for the hair consulting firms to come in and just a strategic plan needs to be owned by the management team. And so it doesn't need to be this huge document. What are the opportunities? What are the threats? What, you can do a strategic plan, a very small version. All a strategic plan deals with the SWOT analysis, which you've all probably heard of. What are our relative strengths in our business? What are our weaknesses? That's internal. From an external standpoint, what do we see coming down the road that are opportunities for us and threats? Is it the consolidation, the continued movement towards higher and higher, more sophisticated technology, the movement toward coordinated supply chains and qualifiers? What are threats to some people or opportunities to others? But you need to be thinking about those, not letting white being scared of them. How are we going to react? How do we take advantage? And in some cases, how do we minimize the risk associated with those? So besides that strategic plan, a detailed business plan, that's more the short-term thing, the year or two that you're operating on. You're, if you really do it right, taking it to a lender, I have a thing I do in class called performance-based borrowing. There's 12 questions that you ought to have the documentation on stuff. And one of the things I tell the students, no lender is going to ask you all these things. But to the extent you've prepared them, you understand what's going on in your business. The second thing is that if a lender comes up with anything, you have some ammunition to negotiate your point on. And the other is if you're doing a business plan, essentially if you can analyze and document your answers to these 12 questions, you've essentially already done the financial components of a business plan. So it, these aren't as onerous, I think, as people make them out to be. But the other thing, as I talked about earlier, I really think you need contingency plans. I've seen way too many businesses that do shock tests, that worry about lay awake at night thinking about what could happen and other things. Take the big ones. There's, all, there's no end to the number of scenarios you can think about. What are the big things that could affect us? And more than that, what would we do if it did? Now, so, these don't have to be problems. They can be opportunities that suddenly come up. How do we capitalize on it? Because the markets go both ways. Other things happen. Piece of ground comes up for sale or for rent. We didn't think about it. Somebody comes along that could agree. If we had them, we could do a lot of things in our operation. But actually... Think, and these don't need to be treatises. You, know, you write a chapter on each. It can be bullet points. Just of, of things that we ought to be doing. Because lenders or anybody else, like you have risk management programs in place, when would we price? Uh, having uh, insurance in place at a certain level. It's too late to do it after you develop the disease. It's too late to do it after an accident happens. It's too late to do it after the crop's gone. You need to do it so that you have time to put them in place and so that you also aren't reacting emotionally. Every once in a while there's somebody out there that their emotional reaction to things, you know, James Bond or somebody like that, makes as good or better decisions under risk as it is. Most people don't. When they're thinking logically and laying them out, you want to give yourself as many options as possible, look and see how those options play together. I think all those going through discussing them, how parts fit together, are part of what makes a better manager. If this is just rote, 
going through doing the exercises, if that's all it is, if it isn't a thinking and discussion process, there's not much being learned out of it. You're just going through the motions. Okay, here's a guy I like real well. His name's John Baker out of Iowa. He's here at the Beginning Performance Center in the Iowa Crisis Hotline. This way he's responsible. He's an attorney. And people, a lot of people doing strategic planning say this is a big waste of time. We're brainstorming. Ask, okay. And his point is, don't be afraid to ask dumb questions. They're a lot easier to handle the dumb mistakes. Another thing I think as far as developing a successor, they need to get that outside perspective. They don't need to be just trained by you. Because you, again, I hope you don't think that you want to create a clone. You want to create, give your knowledge to somebody, your experience, and then you want them to take this on some well. Because this is going to be for your grandchildren or whatever else. You need to see how the rest of the world operates. Jack Welsh, again, the guy said the only, he said the only competitive advantage or sustainable competitive advantage is to learn to adapt faster in competition. He also said that organization needs to be in a continuous learning environment. Everybody in the organization needs to be out there looking for, seeing things, bringing them back, and considering so that the improve, continuous improvement takes place. Work elsewhere and entry requirements. In that little handout I gave you, I have the Whitman Farms employment policy for a family member that says, now a lot of you. There's an awful lot of farm kids that are back on the farm because it's the easiest way they could get, they couldn't get another job so dad and mom are going to give them a job even if it's a tractor driver at first. They're probably very high paid out of me. But that's one or that they couldn't get a job that paid them and provided the bennies the family farm will get. There's some kids that say, well, I'm only making 35000 a year. You know, that's compared to my college. But you have a truck, you have a car, you have a half B, or you have a house, you have a half B, you got insurance program. If you look at Whitman's thing, in the booklet, if you ever see it, it has you go to calculate what your actual compensation is worth. And a lot of people are only getting paid about half of what they're their total packages. And a lot of it is because they're doing it where it's tax free. They're in kind things, the requirement of the job or anything like that that they could get elsewhere. Internships and swaps. It's one thing to go to work for another company. Sometimes it can be farms. I have there's a lot of guys in Apex whose sons of other operators come to work on their operation for a couple of years. Maybe in a different commodity, but they learn different management styles. They also are managed in a system where they are not the crown prince or crown princess or the hired hand. They're what they are. They, they produce on this and they'd like to, most operations would like to see not just somebody get a title change, but to have earned a real promotion before they're eligible to come back to the farm. There has to be a job. In the better farm I've seen, there's some great people there. They came back out of college and went to work for the business. I don't mean that should be prohibited. But it's desirable yeah, because sometimes there's a need right then. We've got to have this position. You're, you know this operation, you're most capable. But if there isn't a job that's opening right then that fits your skill sets, the operation will be better off if you go get some other experience and you bring it back to us. See how, go, we'll pick the top manager we can find and get you in it or like this, the black gold I'm talking about that's in multiple... 
if we're going to start moving or Fair Oaks Dairy or any of that, how that operates, that's a different mindset than the traditional dairyman. You don't have to do all that. Go to work for Riverview or something. It, it's just a change in how you, you look at the relationship. Continuing education, I think, is extremely important. I'm not director of TPAP anymore. I gave that up to success. I've had people ask me, that it something you created and ran for 25 years? Don't you be, I miss the people. And I like the effect that had on people. But I don't. I mean, it's part of, that's what I've been teaching other people part of the time. You have to grow people, develop people, turn it over to them. That's just a natural part of life. I'll be dead one day, too. I mean, that's, it's going to happen. I just want to see it go on in the best hands possible and to structure it in such a way that it goes beyond me, that it doesn't end with me. I'd like to see them do that, too. I think TPAP is a great program. And it's a two-week school, one week one year, one week the next. Several of you here have been through it. The one thing I will tell you, there's people all over the country and a certain number from all over the world in there, so you get different perspectives, different components. This is not a production course. It's a basic management development program, and it's more than just basic. Some of it is a little more advanced than most participants are. I mean, some are way ahead of it. But you will learn as much from the other participants in the room as you will from the faculty. The faculty bring up things. But one of the things we try to do is optimize that interaction. They eat breakfast together, they eat lunch together, dinner together, they have breaks together. We have hospitality room that go up to at night and sit around and talk. We have round tables so that after the faculty who are on during the night, they're on for about an hour and a half in the evening, it didn't further teaching. They're, they're just there so if they triggered an idea or they didn't discuss something people want, they get to come ask questions. One of the requirements, everybody gets to the question, everybody gets to the answer, and any other participant can comment. Or what they're doing. And we've started in the last four years, five years, round tables. We're not round to discussion groups. So we've got a bulletin board that if I want to discuss some prenuptial agreements, peer advisory groups, equipment sharing, managerial accounting, paying family members, in incentive programs, whatever it is, you pick the time. Or you want to meet, we've got room set aside for it. Put your name up there. Nobody has to come. Anybody that's interested comes. Sit down, so it's a free discussion. And I just I think that part of it, we share pictures of everybody, contact information that's in the program, they have to introduce themselves, but this way they can start contacting people. They have questions during the year and stuff. That I think that's part of continuing education. Cornell has their executive program. Like you've been through that before. The Jason Carsis runs. Canada has a C team program. Um, Top producer has a seminar. DTN has an ag sum. I'm sure there's commodity group programs too, and I think those you probably ought to be participating in a commodity group and they bring outstanding speakers. I don't usually, other than the interaction with the other people there, think of those as as much educational, in-depth educational programs as others. Okay, here's something I encourage, and this isn't just CEOs and successors. It may be a good thing to do with, if you look at some of the questions at the front, Maybe something you want to do with key family members who are going to be involved in the business as owners someday or as employees. 
and this is going to sound real touchy-feely, real academic to you. But I know some of the most successful businesses I've known have done it. And it's where they, each person separately says, takes the core values, say, what's important to me? Not talk this over, just write it out. And this, oftentimes, they, do, they start doing this just a week or two before they get back together and share information. It didn't just do What's acceptable to me about what's not acceptable? I'll try to get to this in a minute, but organizational culture is becoming more and more important all the time, particularly as the biggest business gets bigger and the culture isn't just around the home place and how people do things. Vision. What's my future for the vision look like? What do I want from the business? What do I hope will happen? And what am I afraid will happen? Mission. What is the purpose of this business anyway? Why am I here? You may think, let me sit on the corner. What do I want the business to accomplish? What do I want to do or achieve personally? What sacrifices am I willing to make to make it happen? You know, this is a family life balance that's changing a lot with different generations or two professionals in the family. Objectives, how am I going to measure both the businesses and my own performance and progress? A lot of things don't happen if they're not measured. So how am I going to know how I'm doing? Well, part of it is your performance evaluations could be some of it, but are the metrics which we're looking at the business, are we moving in the right direction? What kind of progress? Strategies. What's my plan or accomplish for accomplishing the goals I set out for myself, for the business? And how do I propose to implement? That's tactics, implementing strategies. Okay, just those things, like I said, a lot of people having sat down and done this separately, that sounds like, oh, that's a bunch of mushy BS. But if everybody truly does them separately and they exchanges them, you will learn a heck of a lot more about people and what makes them tick and how much, is there just a whole lot of difference? between where I'm going and they want to go because if that's internal to them we can all be agreeing verbally on the same thing but over time after I'm gone or others they're, they're just not pulling together if I want something to get done we all have to be on this team we don't have to be doing things the same way. We need to be for our talents lie. You know, Collins again said, getting the right people on the bus, more important than getting the right people, getting them in the right seats. What do they do best? What turns them? Their skills are one thing. Talents are another. You know, well, what? I remember uh, the guy that wrote uh, Break All the Rules, first Break All the World, Rules, what the world's greatest managers do differently, said if you want to see what a person's talents are, have them do other jobs and then hold a mirror up in front of them. When they're, go when they're into this and it's motivating, that's their talent. I have a daughter, I don't know where she got the training at all, but she's she can fix anything. A motor, a toaster, any, there's been no training whatsoever in this, but she has a talent for it. This daughter, this Shell Oil Company, is putting together these two divisions. She's a good negotiator. She, my, my whole, all my son-in-laws use Patty as her chief negotiator. 
Shane, after he got this $25,000 bonus from Dynagy, went down and bought a new Nissan Maxima. This has been some years ago. We traded in what he had. And came home, and he was so proud of it. And Patty went back and she got it for 3000 less than he got it. Okay. Well, Patty is this real cute little dark-headed girl, and how she she is a good negotiator. But how personally how it works is you you know this cute little girl talking to you, and then all of a sudden, yeah, and uh, that's part of her story. I, I'll tell you one thing about it. Patty is taking Taekwondo and karate and everything, and. Well, just to give you an idea, my two grandsons, my son-in-law said, you need the, the oldest one. You need to look at the mother if you decide who you want to marry, because that's what she's going to look like someday. And they say, Aunt Patty's still hot. So that's one for... <laughs> but Aunt Patty was walking home from show. She'd worked late one night, was walking back to the bus stop. And some guy came up and grabbed her by the butt. Okay, well, a lot of uh, Patty's first reaction is to go, Rawr! and she said, I either want the solar plexus, the throat, or the nose. I don't know what she hit. He went to the ground like this. <laughs> and she said, Don't ever touch me. She said, Nobody came over anything. As well, it's obvious they didn't need to. There's uh, different people have different talents and attitudes and things like that. And getting fit in what they really do best is a skill. Okay, now I want you to think about this because this one is, this may be as important as anything else as developing a successor. There's traditional performance evaluations. They happen once a year. It's a requirement that we have to do and that goes with your bonus or your raise or whatever it is. That's not. Lee Iacocca used to meet with these managers' direct reports at least quarterly. Traditional performance appraisal drawbacks, you know, are a lot of problems. Like there are a chance just to hear what the boss thinks you've done right and done wrong and others. There's an alternative called the negotiated performance appraisal, and it is a coaching tool, and particularly for the successor. It promotes two-way communication, provides feedback to both the CEO and the successor. It puts a burden of analysis on both parties and helps clarify what needs to be done. Now let's go to these. What it does is require both the reviewee and the reviewer to prepare a list. One by CEO, one by successor. The CEO's list, where he or she thinks the successor is performing well. Second is where they've seen improvement. The third are areas they'd like to see more improvement. The successor puts down where they believe they've been performing well, where they think they've improved, where they think the CEO would like to see them show more improvement. Fourth, what they would like to see the CEO do differently to help them become more effective. And they, if they agree on all those things, there's not much problem. We agree, let's put an action plan in place or continue to do that or anything. A lot of CEOs never get honest feedback on what can you do differently. Maybe it's training, maybe it's going to be cross-training in another area, maybe it's certain resources, whatever. If you're trying to develop this person, take over for you, do what you can. It, you know, if you're a micromanager, you know, Judge me on performance. You know, kind of lay out what you want done and what you want me to accomplish. And then just don't micromanage how I do. A lot of people, it's get the job done. Do you accomplish it in a timely fashion or others? 
Then the performance review session sits on coaching and planning. Recognizing the success or strong points. One of the important things with most businesses is people would like to be acknowledged for what they do. Lay out specific steps for how do we do improve. Action plans. What do, we, what do you need to do here? And setting realistic goals. A lot of things can't be done in the next year. But before you take this business over, or my job, you're going to have to make some progress. And I want these are progress reports. I want to see this you moving more in this direction. And solve the problems that are identified. Some of them are just a matter of getting something out of the way. It addresses two stumbling blocks. One, most people, if they have a weakness, would prefer acknowledging it rather than be blamed for it. I mean, it's, they don't get defensive or anything else. If they, if they didn't do this, somebody chewed them up or, or they real defensive. Or if they point it out themselves, it's they don't take as hard. You know, well, I agree. Help CIEO develop ways they can become more effective, and that's one that doesn't happen often enough. One of the things on organizational culture that I talked about that I think becomes very important overall to the organization continuing to grow and yet not lose its values and other things over time, the one board I'm on has seven value statements. One of them is is transparency. One of them is honesty. So, well, that sounds all good. One of them is innovativeness. And there's some other, there's seven of them. But why you say that's true? They say, well, you can put all these platitudes down you want to. Yeah, this sounds good. Those are part of each person in the organization. Everybody from the janitor to the top that's part of their performance evaluation. How do you reinforce the values of the company and keep the culture going unless it's pushed down through and people are held accountable for it? Though the values of the company, which constitutes their culture, are made part of the performance evaluation. And I don't know that many companies that do that. I mean, I think it's really been affected where they have turnover, where they have distance, other things, and where people think, oh, I do this and that. And if it's going to be pointed out, you know, to somebody doing the performance review, I think they are like the teamwork is another one of these. Where have you? Though, again, they sound like platitudes, but if these are really important to the country, company, they keep reinforcing it. And there's also, it's also of the managers. Do you walk the talk? There's all kinds of people that blow off all kinds of bullshit. They don't live it. This is not on the bottom employees. The senior managers are evaluated, do they do that too? And a lot of times they use 360 reviews. Do you know what those are? Does that make it's where the your coworkers and your employees review you. And if they got those questions and you know they're gonna have them, and that's gonna be part of your review process too, is you manage to looking at those, over time you begin to either disappear or get rewarded for doing those things. Okay.